you're able, and we'll begin our service by singing, Mighty is our God. is mounting. <laughs> Anticipation is growing. Here we go. All right, here we go. Now you should be really well and prepared to sing. Good morning. You can even smile. Mighty is our God. Mighty is our King. Mighty discussing those, and those are the, um, I better not say too much because I don't know enough. Anyway, I think you should all come because I think if you have any interest at all in prophecy and in Israel and the times to come, this guy can tell us a lot about those feasts because I've always wondered 
feast of the booze, that seems kind of ridiculous. Why would you go sit in booze? But it's not. And we need to learn about those things. So if you can come next Sunday night at 6 p.m. and there's going to be some food of some sort there uh, at that. And then also there's a baby shower for Michelle Gillard next Saturday for the women to come to. And so is there any other announcements? Oh, Craig is going to work one day next week. <laughs> That's on Saturday, 7.4. Okay, at 8 o'clock, 7.4, you're watching the shower and kind of work. Okay. They're going to try not to be pounding on the same room that the shower is in. So. Um, and if you're a visitor, there's a little thing you can tear off on your, on your bulletin here. Fill out, and if you have some prayer requests, uh, either public or private, you can make those known, and we can pray for those. Uh, there's a red book at the end of the pews. If you'd like to uh, sign that, pass them on down. And if there's no other announcements, you can get up and say hi to your neighbor. Good day. We thank you, Lord, for the, uh, the gift of working and being able to, to provide for our families and for our communities. And we, Lord, we thank you for uh, these monies that you've given us, and we pray that we can give some of this money back and, as an indication of our love for you and for the care of our brothers and fellow people in this world. And I pray that you'll bless us in your name, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus. Like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But there's something about that name. Jesus, the mere mention of his name, can calm the storm, heal the broken, raise the dead. At the name of Jesus, I've seen sin-hardened men melted, derelicts transformed, the lights of hope put into the eyes of a hopeless child. At the name of Jesus, hatred and bitterness turn to love and forgiveness and arguments cease. I've heard a mother softly breathe his name at the bedside of a child delirious from fever. And I've watched that little body grow quiet and the fevered brow cool. I've sat beside a dying saint, her body racked with pain, who in those final fleeting seconds summoned her last ounce of ebbing strength to whisper Earth's sweetest name, Jesus, Jesus. Emperors have tried to destroy it. Philosophies have tried to stamp it out. Tyrants have tried to wash it from the face of the earth with the very blood of those who claimed it, yet it still stands. And there shall be that final day when every voice that has ever uttered a sound, every voice of Adam's race shall raise in one great mighty chorus to proclaim.
we thank you so very much for the opportunity to assemble together this morning. We thank you for each person, each family that is represented. And as we unite together this morning, we know that there are many among us that are dealing with hurts and cares. And Father, we lift them to you this morning. Lord, we praise you for working in Bill Lewis's life. We're thankful that the heart valve transplant uh, that occurred Thursday was successful, that he is doing well, and there is much talk that he will come home uh, tomorrow. And we praise you for the peace that you offer during that situation. We praise you for the healing that you provide him and so many others. Father, we continue to pray for John Jensen and Irene Jensen, that you continue to give him and her strength. We thank you that Dwayne Shoreman continues to do well after his uh, surgery of a couple weeks ago and ask, Lord, that you would keep your hand upon him, give him strength and encouragement. We praise you that George Campbell is able to climb the steps to participate in the choir uh, after his knee surgery um, several months ago, Lord. We just give you praise. And Father, we thank you that Mike Spielman is here and we ask that your hand would be upon him, that you'd bring healing and strength to his body, that you'd encourage Christy and Ben and Brandon and Katie, his whole family. We just ask that you'd surround them with your perfect peace and comfort. Lord, again, as we come together, we know that there are other requests, other situations that we've kept hidden in our heart, and we give those to you today as well. We know that you are in control. We know that you are a God that does work and can work according to your will. And we pray for your will. We pray for your peace, for your direction. And we pray for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And as you're getting seated, we'll prepare for the choir to sing Victory in Jesus. And I want to thank Rosalie for playing the organ this morning. You know, it's nothing like hearing that organ to get us to sing. Sometimes when we sing, we're a little quiet in our singing, but when that powerful organ plays triumphantly and majestically like that, you can't help but raise your voice, especially when you're in the choir. But let's listen now as the choir sings the Victory in Jesus medley.
as the choir comes down to join you, we invite the children to be dismissed for Children's Church. down if you want to turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans. We're going to be in Romans chapter 1 this morning. And as the choir comes down to join you, I want to thank them again for uh, participating in the worship service. We're going to be in Romans chapter 1 verse 8. read that in just a moment. I want to kind of get everybody caught up. Last week, um, we looked at Philippians uh, to see the appreciation of the pastor. This month is Clergy Appreciation Month or Pastor Appreciation Month, and I tried to twist it up or change it up just a little bit. And last week, we talked about and explored three different things that Paul was thankful for, three things that Paul appreciated concerning the church at Philippi. Uh, and they included a common cause, uh, the gospel of Christ that Paul and the church of Philippi shared. It also included a common confidence uh, that they recognized that it was God's hand and God's work and God's completion that they celebrated. And the third thing was a common concern. Um, and that was the idea that not only did Paul care about the church of Philippi, but the church of Philippi cared about Paul. This week, uh, as we look at Romans chapter 1, we see the heart of the pastor. Uh, what it is that Pastor Paul desires for the church to whom he ministered. All right. And so we are going to read verses 8 to 17 of Romans chapter 1. It says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God, oh, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to have you stand. I've only been here five years, it's just. All right, let's start all the way over. No, just kidding. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to, to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your word, the opportunity to read it this morning, to apply it in our lives. And we do pray, Lord God, that your presence would be with us. We pray that you would uh, help anything that might hinder us from focusing on you today, this hour, this moment. Anything that might distract us, we lay it down, we set it aside. And we desire to focus wholeheartedly on you and your word. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts this morning for your glory, for our benefit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Before we dive into Romans chapter 1, uh, last week I shared 
two letters um, to First Baptist Church of Clay Center from previous pastors. Um, letters that I shared last week were uh, from Pastor George Henry and Pastor Dan Klein. Um, and they shared in those letters what you as a congregation meant to them. This week I do the same. I have a couple more letters. Uh, you may wonder what the pastor does on his days off. I have six days off, you know, a week. <laughs> on my days off, I talk to old pastors or former pastors and former people that are associated with our church. The first one is a letter from Pastor Marvin George. And um, although he wasn't a, officially a senior pastor, he does have a connection with First Baptist Church of, of um, Clay Center. <coughs> Uh, he starts off and he says, I, Marvin George, a servant of Jesus the Christ, called by God to preach the gospel, which I believed in you also, this gospel gifted to us by God for salvation, which reconciles us to him. To the First Baptist Church of Clay Center, whom I remember often in my prayers and with fondness for the love and care, not only I, but also my family received while in your presence. It was, though, it was you, through God's will and calling, uh, did set me apart for service by commissioning me to preach the gospel of Jesus and whom you ordained and sent forth to carry the message of good news to all I might meet. We are still connected by the Holy Spirit with hope of God to someday meet again in glory. He goes on to say, okay, enough of that. I'm no Paul. Although the statement above is true, uh, you know I don't talk like that. So what's up, y'all? <laughs> He says, I would like to say from the first time we came to this church, we were welcome. The life of a military family is at best unstable, but when we became a part of this local body, we found a place to call home. Our immediate families were far away, and not having a close support structure is hard. You became our family. You took us into your homes, even though we, mostly me, were foreigners. You became our brothers and sisters not only in spirit, but also in life. Raising children away from their grandparents is tough, but they found grandparents here. You loved them and cared for them like your own. You treated Sandra and I like family always. You saw the Lord's calling on my life and were gracious to allow me to preach when possible. You licensed me to preach the gospel and you ordained me for the purpose of ministry. You will always be our family no matter where the Lord leads us. With fondness of heart, God's blessings, and our love, Marvin and Sandra. And I also have a letter from Pastor Bob Anthorne. And he, unlike the other pastors that have shared, actually sent a real letter in the mail with a stamp on it. <laughs> to First Baptist Church family, greetings. I often think of the First Baptist Church family with gratitude to the Lord for my time with you. It was, no, or it was longer than expected as one candidate after another failed to complete the process. Virginia and I also appreciated that your search committee didn't panic and lower the standard for the new, their new leader. Virginia and I remember you as a fine, active, ministering congregation with programming for all. It is our hope that your program has remained strong and that your numbers remain steady or growing. One early evening, some middle high, middle high girls, middle, middle school girls, I guess, uh, came to the parsonage. They asked us to go to the building about an hour later. When we arrived, they put on a brief skit. One girl was discouraged because she didn't belong to the in-group and was not considered to be cool. The other two came to her and assured her that she was cool because she belonged to Jesus. We appreciated the Circle J program, the evening group that met in homes after the Bible study, and so much more. Especially meaningful have been the warm friends we found there. And I was sharing with Jeff um, Yarrow that I didn't want to read this last part, but since it was part of the letter, he said I had to. He said, when Pastor Coleman and his young family joined you, my feeling was that you had a quality leader. It's in writing. <laughs> Our hope is for unity and a lengthy, a lengthy pastor-congregation relationship. God bless you as you continue to serve and please him with a capital H, not me, but God. So just, we're all clear. We continue to pray for you regularly. Sincerely in him, Bob and Virginia Hanthorne. 
And again, like last week, um, we see the importance of that. We see how that encourages us and motivates us and helps us to celebrate what God has done and is doing in our congregation. These men that have blessed us as pastors um, have been blessed by our support and our encouragement. But we reflect on the truth that it is indeed God who works, right? And who brings us together to serve Him. It is He that moves in our hearts, that challenges our hearts, directs and convicts our hearts, and helps us to prioritize matters in our hearts. And that is the message that we see here in Paul's letter to the Romans. First, I want to draw our attention to Romans chapter 1, verse 8. It says, For I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Last week, Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, uh, to the Philippian church, and there, mentioned their fellowship with the gospel. He also mentioned that idea of he was thankful for them. And here we see that again. They treasured the gospel, the Philippian church. They kept it. They participated in it. Here, we see that Paul, the pastor, and his heart for the congregation, that he has a heart for their reputation. He has a heart for their reputation. The Bible puts an emphasis on reputation and the importance of it. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, concerning deacons, we are instructed that deacons are to be of good reputation. Reputation in English means the estimation in which a person or thing is held, especially by the community or the public generally. The estimation in which a person or thing is held especially by the community of the public generally. When Timothy wrote reputation there, he was referring to those attributes of character that are witnessed. You know, when you see people, those, those first thoughts that you think about them, you know, that uh, we're in the midst of a presidential election, I can't believe it's still 12 months away, but I feel like it's already been going on for 12 months. And one of the things they love to do is, is mention a political character, I shouldn't say character, but in many ways they are, a political uh, candidate, and they ask people for uh, just one word that describes them. And of course, depending on whether you are in favor of them or in opposition to them, you'll say one word or another. But if we stop and think about reputation, if we picked anybody just out from the congregation this morning, and don't worry, I'm not going to do it, but if we plucked one of you out and plopped you up here on the platform and asked people, we went around person to person to say, use one word to describe that person, we would get a pretty fair description of their character, of their reputation. Paul was concerned about their reputation. When Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1 about reputation, he meant more than just this estimation. All right? He meant the expression, an expression of that estimation. It's one thing to think it, right? You know, if we pick a person and any person and, and just think, what do I think about that person? You know, my mom always said, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all, right? Right? But if we picked a person, the reputation is that estimation. But when Paul is talking about it here, it is it's spoken. It's more than just the estimation. It's an expression of that estimation. It's, it's to speak it. In English, it says your faith is spoken of. But what is meant is this. Your faith is proclaimed. Your faith is celebrated. Your faith is declared openly. And really we could say your faith is preached. These people, this church that Paul was writing to, they were known as a church of faith. It was declared, it was known, it was seen, it was proclaimed. 
Paul had a heart for this church at Rome. He wanted to and wanted to come and see him and wanted to come and see him and wanted to come to see him and for many different reasons he wasn't able to. And in his absence though, he desired there's to be a reputation that honored God. Now we know and we remember that this church of Rome, it struggled because of the community in which it resided. Rome was known for immorality, for false gods. They struggled, many of them, with the idea of grace. You know, later on, Paul has to write to them in Romans chapter 6, because some thought, well, I love this grace, you know. When I sin and ask God to forgive me, he gives me grace. So they thought, well, I'm going to sin more, and the more I sin, the more grace I'm going to get. And he says, no, 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 that's not what you're supposed to do. So they struggled. But he celebrated the truth of their reputation, that their reputation was known. And what was their reputation? They were known for faith. Again, it's a good question for us to stop and think, what's my reputation? What am I known for? What does God think of me? What does the community think of me? What does my spouse think of me? Am I thought to be proud and selfish and vindictive? Or am I thought to be honest and gracious and generous? The consideration of our reputation is important because it makes a difference. Proverbs 22 verse 1 says, A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. And favor is better than silver or gold. Now, of course, the world we live in in 2015, people are willing to get rid of their reputation, to trash their reputation for money. You know, we'll do all kinds of stuff for money. Just give it to me. I want what money buys, the, the privilege that money buys, the freedom that money buys. It's not real freedom. So what if I'm known for doing X, Y, Z? So what if I know that I'm not honest, that I'll cut corners, that I'll stab you in the back? I don't care as long as I have the money. That's the world that we live in. And character, we don't, we don't judge people by their character. We judge people by what they have anymore. You got a big house, a big car, a big job? Well, you must be fantastic. Your character stinks? Oh, well. Your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Hmm. What would it be for us, for me? As a pastor, what a blessing it would be. Now, were, were the Romans perfect? No. They weren't perfect. But they were faithful. They were faithful. They were confident. They were trusting. They were faithful, believing God. Paul had a heart for their reputation. Second, we see that he had a heart for their uh, recept. I have changed this word. Recep receptivity. Does that make sense? I said reception originally, and I was like, well, that's not quite right. Receptivity. That he wanted them to be receptive. He was glad that they were receptive. You got that idea? He had a heart for their receptivity. Hey, Jonathan. I just saw you up there. Didn't you just have a birthday? Oh, happy birthday. Should we have him come down and give him the spankings now? <laughs> receptivity. They had a reputation. He cared and had a heart for their reputation. And he had a heart for that other R word that I'm having a problem with this morning. Receptivity. Reception. He wanted them to be receptive. Verse 11, it says, For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. Paul wanted them to be receptive. He wanted them to receive what God had to offer them through Paul. You know, as a pastor, a lot of times people say, Well, pastor, what are you going to say? Well, and I'm, I don't know half the time. Whatever God gives me. That's why some Sunday mornings... Uh, the bulletin and my sermon don't match because between the time it was printed and the time that I deliver it, God says, no, 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 no. 
We're changing this. We're going in a different direction. You know? And that's okay. You're always very uh, accepting of that because I believe it's demonstration that God is working and God is leading. But being receptive. Paul wanted them to be receptive. And the great thing, of course, is it's not my words. It's not my thoughts. I don't want you to know what Matthew has to say. I want you to know what God has to say. But he wanted them to be receptive. You know, over the past several weeks, and there's, a, there's always a, a danger with this receptivity, the potential for it. Over the past several weeks, there have been many sales boys and girls that have visited the parsonage. And I always, it never bothers me. Um, we've had people selling cookie dough for football and popcorn for Boy Scouts and magazines for school. You know, and I always admire, admire those young people that go outside their comfort zone where it is, is not necessarily, not physically unsafe, but emotionally. They go outside their comfort zone to make a sale by asking people that they don't know. We had some young men come and they knocked on the door and asked if we would buy cookie dough from them. Well, of course, I'm a Baptist. I like cookies. I'll buy cookie dough. You know? But they didn't know. There's this big white house they walk up to. You know, Baptists were supposed to frown all the time, right? No. But they went outside their comfort zone. And what, did that, what does that demonstrate? It demonstrates to me that they care. If they didn't care, they wouldn't go ask. They wouldn't try to make the sale. They just would sit home and say, tough coach, tough teacher, tough whoever. I'm not going to do it. But they make the risk. They make the risk, the risk. And as a pastor, there's a risk too. You know, pastors try to teach. They try to share. They try to motivate um, through God, through the work of the Holy Spirit, to motivate the congregation and individuals. We try to motivate them to, to get outside their comfort zone, to pursue Christ, to deepen their faith, to develop unity, to press on towards maturity. And you know, as we all know, there's no guarantee of a positive response. There's no guarantee. The message can be given, the facts laid out, the biblical principles explored, the need demonstrated, but no reaction, no response, no reception. Paul, as all pastors, I imagine, had a heart for the receptivity of the church at Rome. He wanted them to receive what he had been given by God for them. And what was given? Well, you know, he says he wanted to impart some spiritual gift. And while this verse doesn't give us much details, we know that the letter itself, what we call the book of Romans, has become one of our most treasured books of the Bible. Very quickly, let me just share a couple things that we learned. Some of the verses from the book of Romans, this letter to the church at Rome. Romans 1.16, which I just read. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Romans 5, 12, therefore just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin and in this way death came to all people because all have sinned. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 8, 1, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who've been called according to his purpose. I know Irene Jensen likes that verse. Romans 8, 38, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what is God's will, what God's will is, is good, pleasing, and perfect will. These are just a few, a few verses of, of what we learn in the book of Romans, in this letter to the church of Rome. Can you imagine being there, learning it? He wanted them to be receptive. He had a heart that they would receive the message. The truth is that Paul's writing, of course, is God's word. It's a wonderful gift that we've been given. But simply knowing the verses isn't enough, is it? Being able to re repeat them or recite them or regurgitate them from memory. It's not what Paul wants for us. It's not what I want for us. It's not what God wants for us, is it? No. He wants us to receive it and to live it. To live it, to make it real for us. Paul didn't want them to play church, you know. Would have been novel. It would have been a new thing. It was the new religion on the block, Christianity. You know? It's kind of like when a new restaurant opens up in town. Everybody goes to it. I remember when Chick-fil-A opened up in Manhattan. You couldn't even get in the parking lot for about, I don't even know how long. We didn't even try to go near there. People get excited. You know? And the excitement wears off. We don't want to play church. We don't want to play games. We want to have a real, life-changing, life-impacting, life-altering relationship with God through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. One that impacts, changes, and alters our life so that we can in turn be used to impact, change, and alter the lives of others for Jesus Christ. That's the goal. Paul had a heart for their reputation. He had a heart for their recipe. I can't even say it. I could say it earlier. R E C E R E C E P T I V I T Y. Recipe. Whatever. Re receptivity. Right. There. Thank you. I'll just look at Patricia. I got my syllable, the accent on the wrong syllable. That was the problem. But. The third thing is that we see that Paul. Paul the pastor had a heart for readiness. Verse 15 says, So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. They had a reputation of faith. He desired them to be receptive. You'll all remember that second point. Because he was ready. He was ready. This means he was eager. He was willing, you know. And we've talked about this idea before, that idea of being Bought, of buying in, of being excited, of being active in something, right? This word comes from a combination of two words, and it's the ideas of before and passion, you know? Not, you know, it's that idea of we know that something exciting is going to happen. It reminds me of uh, children at play when they play uh, hide-and-seek, you know? You ever see a bunch of kids play hide-and-seek? There'll be one kid, like there's little old Gina over here in the corner, and she counts, and little Bob and little Rex are running around Betty's house trying to find some place to hide. And once the designated number is reached, whether it's 10 or 20 or 100,000, whatever it is, you know, then El Gina cries out, what? Ready or not, here I come. You know, and normally, when they get to that point, it's not, oh, well, I guess it's time for me to find you. It's... I'm coming! Here I am! And El Gina runs all around the house, oh, looking everywhere for him. <laughs> of course, what she doesn't know is Betty's let him out the back door and there's three blocks down. <laughs> but it's to be ready. It's excited. They're, they are loosed. And it's with the same sense of enthusiasm that Paul addresses this congregation. The same sense. He says, I hear your reputation of faith. I pray that you are receptive because I am 
ready. I am ready. And as a pastor, you know, there have been many times that I have approached this podium or, or others, and I have thought, I pray that we are ready for this. That we are all ready. Not that I am just ready to give a message, but that we are all ready to interact together with the Holy Spirit. Paul had a heart of readiness, and he shared his gift with them in this letter, and ultimately in pers person. This letter from Pastor Paul, again, shows us the heart of the pastor. Last week we saw the pastors, how he appreciated the congregation. We see the desire of the pastor for the congregation to have a reputation that honors God, a receptivity that honors God, and a readiness that honors God. This applied to the members, but it also applied to the pastor. This morning I close as I did last week with a letter to our church. Dear First Baptist Church of Clay Center, Kansas, it is ever my prayer that I would remain worthy of the call that God has placed upon my life and those of my family. It is my prayer that I would remain worthy of the trust that you have placed with me. It is my prayer that I would remain ready to speak the words that must be spoken with boldness and clarity and love and truth in a time when it is not convenient or popular. It is my prayer that God, it is my prayer that we all will continue to trust God, believe in Christ, and respond to the Holy Spirit. It is my prayer that God will awaken us, revive us, renew us. That he will challenge us, convict us, persuade us to reach out in new ways to new people with the true message of salvation through Jesus Christ for his glory. Let us pray. Father God, we do thank you so very much for the opportunity to come together this morning. We thank you for each one this year. And we pray that we would have a heart for our own reputation, for our own receptivity, and our own readiness. We pray that we would be people that would live lives that demonstrate you, God. That we would, we would be people with open hearts and minds focused on your direction. And we pray that we would be ever ready to be used by you and in your glory. Father, as we think of Romans and we think of the great truth that it reminds us that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. That there's none righteous, no, not one. The wages of sin is death. Lord, as we sit in this room this morning and we celebrate what you're doing in our lives individually and collectively, we recognize that we cannot earn a relationship with God. But rather, through the sacrifice of Jesus, we can come boldly before God, who desires to have a relationship with us. Christ's blood pays for the sin. He allows us to come before you. The work of the Holy Spirit. And we pray that each and every one of us that is here this morning has made that decision, has been introduced to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That each of us have recognized what he has been done. And each of us have laid down our lives. Each of us have set aside our will and seek rather to please the Lord and follow your direction and your will for your glory. We thank you for this time. We thank you for the blessing of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we have our hymn of invitation. <clears throat>
invite you to come back this evening at 6.30. We're looking at Revelation chapter 10, so you're all invited to participate in that. But let us uh, be dismissed with prayer. And again, I just want to remind you about the baby shower next Saturday and the uh, church work day. So let's be dismissed. Father God, go with us now as we go to our homes or other destinations. We pray that throughout this day we would demonstrate your love because you have loved us so much. And we each desire to be loved. Go with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.